everyone to the Weird Libertarians Daily Podcast. We're going to be talking about the coup in Venezuela today. I'm your host, Hody Johns. I am joined with the ever-magnificent Reinhold. Reinhold, um, I hear your day was busy, but maybe a little less busy than busy. if you lived uh, south of the equator today. It was a little less uh, harrowing. <laughs> so... <laughs> traffic, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so we've covered in depth what's going on in Venezuela. A lot of our listeners are already familiar with the situation there, but but uh, let, let's talk a little at least. Uh, you want to talk about the if this is even a coup. So I guess that's right. the right so, place to start. Help me out. So just, just um, the way I understand everything that happened with Venezuela is that they had a rec- a, an election that was like a recall election. So Maduro says he won it, but the every inspector says he didn't, right? Every inspector says, no, 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 that's, uh, you lost, this is it. So, And Maduro is the I, current right, president. Right, yeah. so by, by the rules of their own governmental documentation, if this situation happens, the there's a person designated inside the government who's supposed to take over as acting president mm-hmm. while new elections can be um, scheduled. Yeah. So that's what got triggered. The person who they're saying is trying to initiate a coup and is trying to get the him to leave office is that person who was designated as being the person to take over. So technically, by the rules of their own government, he should be the one that's in charge, while the um, Maduro should be stepping down. He doesn't want to, so he's you know doing his. This is a coup. Everybody's trying to take control from me. Why is the U.S. government involved? Blah blah blah. You know all that stuff. So that's that's the thing. So was calling it a coup, I think, is missing the point that that's not really. It's not really what you would normally call a coup. Sure. Welcome, by the way, Dale. How are you doing today, buddy? Oh, second Monday. But hey, you know what? It is what it is. But nothing like coming back for a second helping of Monday. And we're talking about Vene- we're talking about Venezuela, not my own private Idaho here. So okay, yeah. all right. Well, let's talk about some people that have had maybe a slightly worse day than you today. Yeah, let's do that. I'll feel better. Now I will say this, and I was just looking at it. Um, it I uh, from what I understand, there's no deaths reported, and there's some videos that look not safe for work, but I guess they were using <laughs> rubber bullets. So when you piece, well, the, the trucks running over people didn't look good either. And that also does not look great. Yeah. But I guess I guess from uh, again, this is from secondary sources. But as of now, nobody actually died. Died. But officially, we know uh, of, you know. right. But to address your point, Reinhold, you are correct. Under the Constitution of Venezuela, the National Assembly can step in if there's a controversy. Now, the U.N. actually investigated the election and found that it did get rigged and it was Mm -hmm. and this is a quote outcome determinative, meaning it actually changed the outcome. So he would not have been elected president if they didn't tamper with it. So you do have and again, this is the U.N. I don't trust the U.N. further than I can throw them. I get it. None of us do. But there's some shady business around it. and, And there certainly needs to be as much transparency as possible. It's not hard to believe that that's what happened, and there's got to be somebody looking into it. So just because it's the UN doesn't mean that they're wrong, right? I mean, exactly. I think everybody can look at this and go, "This country has been screaming about their leadership all this time. They had an election. He won." I just don't believe that. You know, that's that's hard to buy, considering what we know about the state of that country right now. Yeah. Well, and specifically what they did was they looked into the U.N. did an investigation and they couldn't get into maybe the bigger cities. What they found is the the population of the smaller outskirts um, in Venezuela and the suburban areas, they couldn't find anybody there. Uh, They couldn't find anybody to that that was like, oh, yeah, we all support him. And they would have votes for him bigger than the population itself. So, I mean, hey, we have a Chicago in our nation. We know how it goes. I get it. You know, there's messed up stuff that happens and you wish it was more transparent. It's not. So the idea is, is they wanted to do an investigation. Maduro forbid the investigation, said, no, we're not doing that. And of course, this is kind of what you get. Now, what triggered it today, I'm just going to give people some hard facts before we kind of talk about it. So the reason this violence happened today is the the opposition leader Juan Guaido, and he is the he's the one that the assembly steps in, the interim guy, and they actually swore him. The assembly even swore him in on January twenty third of this really? year as president. Yeah, 
<laughs> and so um, he's been recognized as Venezuela's leaders. A few countries have. It's actually split on the countries. I'll read those off in a second. But today, he gave an address in which he had some military people with him. Now, the reason that's a big deal is because the, uh, the general of the army and, and several military leaders have said they're going to back Maduro, the existing leader. So when Guaido appeared with these military members today, it, it, it gave people hope in saying, oh, maybe the military is split. Because the issue that's keeping people from a full-on uprising against Maduro is you got to fight against the U.S. military. <laughs> of course, we... Yeah, you can imagine that similar situation here in the U.S., right? Because if we decided to do something that got big enough that the military was like, yeah, we're going to put down their enemies no matter what. And then you see, you know, maybe somebody, so you know, maybe a few factions of military guys support your cause. It would give you hope as opposed to the entire military, U.S. military coming down on you. So it's just kind of a similar situation that you got going on there. Um, specifically today... Uh, and this is a quote, he promised to end the rule of social of the socialist Maduro regime. regime. And so, Garris, this is incendiary language, not just in overthrowing Maduro, but also overthrowing the entire type of government that he has. And I'm not blaming him for being incendiary. I mean, I'm not in love with socialism, so if it's something that has to get overthrown, then it's something that has to get overthrown. But that that is what, spi- what kind of sparked everything today. So Dale, I'll let you give you a few a few thoughts as well. Like, and actually, we'll even head back to you too, Reinhold. Just as far as anything you think of can think of within what I just said. Well, while while you guys were were talking, I did a little digging around about the Second Amendment in Venezuela, and it turns out back in 2012 they banned uh, the commercial sale and private ownership of guns. So um, I, I I find that to be very interesting because what if that had not have happened or folks chose not to comply with that man, I'm, you know, I I know I'm hitting the second amendment right away, but would it have gotten, would have gotten to to this point if Chavez hadn't banned guns in the first place? That's one question I would ask on that, not trying to necessarily go off script, but no, that's perfectly valid. That's absolutely something we're talking about right now. And, and the thing is, you mentioned Hody Johns. Um, I have a, I have a couple of friends who are, you know, they're they're not. He's not a collapsitarian, but he talks a lot about being prepared and the uh, side of the house where, uh, you know, be prepared for the upcoming civil war. And it's like mm-hmm. I always tell him, listen, there's if if that happens, there's going to be a split in the military. They're not necessarily going to all side with the government. They're like, no, no, no. They're all drones. They'll side with the they'll side with the government immediately. And I'm just like, mm, maybe not. So we can maybe look at, you know, Venezuela as a template for, you know bad the 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 negative uh the negative aspects of socialism and how we really shouldn't be walking down that road as close as we are sure i'm gonna put you on pause there because reinhold's face tells me he had something to say about that oh no just uh it the idea that the entire military would just say you know we're, we're drones we're going to follow the government that's i mean our history shows that that's not the case we had a civil war You know, this is uh, people are going to do what they think is right. And they're human beings and they're individuals. So there's no way the whole military. I mean, it's you're going to have National Guard people come out. You're going to have militia people come out. You're going to have military people who are going to drop their their guns and go to the other side. It's that would all happen in in a civil type of war here. Uh, The question is, is we're ever going to get to that point? I don't think we are anywhere near that point currently. Uh, I remember I remember in the 60s. In early 70s where we were a lot closer to it than we are now in my opinion um when you had actual race riots going on in larger cities and you had some real concerns that there could be some kind of civil war erupt um but it's still something to consider and and the question is, is if, if all these people in venezuela had guns um would the protests that are going on today have been as peaceful uh or there would have been a lot more violence it's hard to say but standing up for your rights, I understand you need, you need a way to do that. I'm just just saying we would probably be seeing a different scene down there today if, it, if uh, they did have a large selection of guns. And as I understand it, there's, there's complaints that there are some Cuban actors in Venezuela trying to spur this on, which is, you know, infuriating Maduro. But um, and no, it's actually they're working for the Maduro government. That's right. And um because that's what's got Trump upset. He's wanting to do a blockade on Cuba 
And Cuba is like, those aren't our military, though, you know, just because they're from Cuba and they're a, a military organization, just like one of our militias went down there on their own. They're not being sent there by the Cuban government. The Cuban government can't really control that. Right. So. Yeah. Well, let me uh, let me give you a bit of information then. And, and this is something that I want both of you to dis discuss as well. So the, the sides that have sided with Maduro, that this is the incumbent president, the guy who exists as right. Right. As of now, we think Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, Mexico, the U.N., even though they found that Maduro stole the election, has even said, well, that, you know, we're still not going to support Guaido and Cuba. Uh, have all sided with the existing government, Maduro. Guaido, no surprise, we've already talked about the U.S. has already funded um, fun, funded and sponsored the insurgency. So we have Canada, us, the U.K., Brazil, Peru, Chile, and Argentina all supporting Guaido. So it's pretty even split and not along your common, it, not along similar allies' enemies' lines. Now, I think Trump here is doing a two birds with one stone thing because he said, and, and who knows if this is true or whether it's just a clever tactic, that uh, he's made pu public that Maduro is going to leave uh, Venezuela today for Cuba until the Russians told them that that wouldn't look good. And so it simultaneously made Russia, Cuba, and Maduro all look like cowards and look really bad. And so he- Also, he, well, also remember Cuba came out recently after that was announced and said that that was fake news and they never did that. Yeah, and so actually that's why, I, 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 that's actually the end of my statement. I wanted to turn that back over to you guys. All right, so yeah, that's that's amazing to me that you know, everybody talks about the Trump and Russia stuff, and then Trump calls out Russia through Pompeo, mm -hmm. and Russia responds with, that's fake news. I mean, it's, it's hilarious to figure out what's going on at this point. Right. How, how in the pocket is he now? I mean, I guess the Mueller report already proved that, that there was probably nothing to it, but, uh, but nah, there, was, even, there was nothing. Even more that. obvious now that he wasn't in the pocket, and this isn't the first time he's decided to agitate Well, Russia, I mean, so. in the, yeah, in the, in the last two years since he's been president, you know, as much as I dis like his running of the government and being president you and me both buddy it's done he has done a lot to punish russia mm -hmm. through sanctions and all kinds of things statements that he's made that um you know wouldn't have been the case if he if what the accusations were were true so yeah true dale any fact, i think i think some of them are wrong but <laughs> right I, I do see the, the, the irony and the humor and the fact that Russia called fake news on Trump for Trump calling out Russia being part of that. Um, I just got us. I, I have the, the CNN pages open that, that I was sent over. And it just it just updated, says the coup has been defeated. Um, Maduro says that the coup has been defeated. It's, is it OK if I read read that? Yeah, read that update that's here? an update as of less than a minute ago. Go ahead. This is this is from CNN. So uh, oh, right. The, com the oh. Communist News Network, but right. whatever. Greens of salt everywhere. Believe me, we're doused in salt. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro said protesters led by opposition leader Juan. It's Guaido. Juan Guaido. And uh, Leopoldo Lopez were tantamount to an attempted coup, but their efforts have been defeated. I want to congratulate you for the firm, loyal, and courageous attitude with which you have led the defeat of a small group that tried to fill Venezuela with violence, Maduro said. Factors from the right wing uh, of the popular Will Terrorist Party led the coup d'etat, he said, referring to Guaido and Lopez's uh, political party. Um, then it goes on talking about the empire seeks to attack and overthrow a legitimate government. Um, to enslave Venezuela. Yeah, to enslave Venezuela. And he doesn't give any further details uh, beyond that. So it's really hilarious, too. Because all, all I get is an image. And I don't know if you, either of you remember this or not, but the image of the Iraq spokesman when we were attacking. Iraq saying oh, everything's fine. We're 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 uh, defeating the uh, Americans. Uh, everything's good. <laughs> he was well, come on. That's just propaganda. Right. Yeah. So. The, the, no. I, and and I appreciate you reading that, Dale. It's something. But here's here's the thing about it. And, and there's a couple things that come to mind. Just I mean, you're literally this is as fresh off the presses as it gets. 
So this is as hot a take as it gets without me sitting down and thinking about it a little longer. But first of all, this was a this was a demonstration. This isn't the entire movement. So this Guaido protest is not going away. Uh, like I said from the Venezuela episode, Venezuela is in a, in a rough spot, guys. Their inflation since what one year ago has gone up by something million percent or 100, uh, 100, 1546 percent something crazy and so they can't afford things i i just heard an interview with somebody who's from there who said they still can't they're still working on finding cats to eat um from somebody who lives there the majority of their the problem is is now that they're in instability the majority of their medicine was provided by charity and outside um outside countries uh providing charity for them and so now they don't have any medicine anymore of course their mortality rates we talked about is that as well being the infant mortality being the highest in the world people starving themselves to death i mean it's just it's nasty and so the thing is is he can say, yeah, this is fixed, and even if he puts down Guaido, which he, he hasn't, this this is still, he's still the sworn-in president under the National Assembly, Guaido is. But even if he does put down Guaido, it doesn't make all his, pe- his people suddenly healthy and suddenly do- dormant. You know, uh, there's seven, from what I'm reading, 71 people in the hospital, but you gotta understand that this is a a country whose population is a lot greater than 71 people. It was just 71 people willing to get hurt in order for them to see. And so at this time, yeah. Right, at this time. And the other thing is this is just incendiary language. Sever- I mean, he calls them terrorists. Uh, think about this in America. I mean, we we've done similar things where we have the right and the left try to demonize each other and try to get the violence and hatred up by saying they hate hate America, they hate peace, they hate they love the terrorists. You know, we, we do this type of thing too. But here, I think you can take a step back and see what that looks like from an outside point of view and how incendiary that is and how you just you're really encouraging them towards violence and you kind of get what's coming to you when it happens. Um, he's claiming a victory for peace when obviously he's just claiming a victory for himself. His people are starving to death. There's no peace in Venezuela right now. Well, and how much, how much do we say at this point has sanctions ever really worked where it didn't, uh, harm the people of the, of the country and the people running the country are just fine because they're going to find ways to take care of themselves and hoard everything that they, all the power that they have and all the resources. So sanctions always end up hurting the people and killing them like we did with the rack for 12 years before we actually went in and did something there. But that's, that's the main concern is that the United States has been put sanctions on them and other people put sanctions on them in Venezuela for years. And I just think it's just exacerbated the problem, which isn't the reason why they're failing, but it's not helping them in any way. Yeah. Any more words of wisdom there, Dale? You know, I, the, what I what I try to think of what I'm trying to think of at this point because I've heard different shows that, that have talked about the uh, the Venezuela situation. I think Chris had, um, I think Dear Leader had someone on who who had family in, in Venezuela, and it kind of makes me think like, uh, short of U.S. military intervention, I mean, what are what if anything can can we do on the free market charitable side of the house do to to help the situation? I mean it. <laughs> So, um, the, these, your, the answer to this question is related, is related also to, to what you're asking. The, the, I believe she was from Ecuador, the person that, yes. that Chris was talking with, but that's actually the number one country that, um, that, that they fled to. Now, of course, wow. it's a, uh, I, I don't want to demonize all socialists, I, but it is a, what I will call a modern Stalinist socialist country. Not and, all socialists, Cody. Right. Hashtag not all socialists. But but, you know, it's doing the classic thing where they close the borders, which, by the way, uh, right wing, that's socialist. So anyway, they close the borders. They're not supposed to escape. But there has been three million uh, people from uh, citizens of Venezuela who have escaped to other countries and into Ecuador. So and I want you to go back to you, Dale, because I think you should suggest more things. It just is related to your question. One of the things we can do to help. Uh, open the borders, um, not only to keep to let them out, but to keep, you know, it, it stops people from stay, having to stay in. As soon as you have a militarized border, there's nothing to stop 
the country from keeping you in as well and 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 countries doing that i mean you can see it in venezuela right now um maduro has turned away aid at the border several times uh free aid offered to the citizens but that that delegitimizes his power to see help coming in from other places he needs the people to believe he is their only hope and so he turns them away at the border. So closed borders are a huge problem in this situation. And I hate to take this into a discussion that's obviously uh, inflammatory to a lot of people, but frankly, opening the borders would be the most merciful thing we could do to Venezuelan refugees. We don't necessarily have to send military action to get them out, but we need, for the, if they escape, they need a place to go. And right. frankly, Again, I've said this a lot, but we just need to abandon policies that make it so that we can't open the borders. Yes, welfare might go up a little. Yes, you know, cer certain there might be certain side effects depending on whose statistics you look at. I would contend with those statistics, and but that's a separate discussion. But either way, we need to get rid of policies that make it so that we can't have open borders so that country can once again become the... the I mean, what's etched on the Statue of Liberty? Give me your tired, your poor, your weak. You're, you know, you're sick. We want, we want the cra the scraps because this is a place where you become strong. This is not a place where we're, we're supposed to only be the strong need only apply. That just isn't the American promise. That's absolutely right. Well, and I, I agree with you. I mean, aside from, you don't even need, I mean, if, you know, this whole, this whole open closed border thing, it doesn't necessarily have to be either or. I mean, basically what it amounts to is our country could do what it used to do at, at, at Ellis Island. Disease check security check go and then you're, you're on the path at that point i mean it, it it's not the complicated average, the average wait time at ellis island was three hours to get in the country boom now to get in the country it's a year year and a half oh, legally that's just that's just that's just as an asylum seeker right. okay as an asylum order and going through the process we have people from mexico who applied in 1996 that are just now getting their stuff heard Right. That's how long backup we have on that. It's ridiculous to me. And people are saying we have an emergency at the border when, you know, they're saying 3000 people are crossing the border a day. We used to service 10,000 people a day at Ellis Island. And that was less than half of the people that came into this country. So over 20,000 people a day were coming into this country a hundred years ago. And you're telling me we can't do as good as they did. Right. And those people who came in and in the early 1900s fueled the second um, industrial revolution, worked in the factories and, and made this country what it is. And most of the people who are here come from someone who came about that time. So I, I did not know no that about Ellis Island. That's fascinating. And to think with all the technology we have, how much faster it would even be now. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you get a database and, and you can check people on security. You can check them for, I mean, they used to, uh, 100 years ago, they would, the doctors were so well trained that they could look at somebody and know whether or not they were communicable or, or whatever. I mean, that's how much they had seen it and knew what they were doing. Um, but with the testing we have now, how long does it take to tell somebody who's got some dangerous disease that we want to make sure, you know, we at least keep in quarantine until they're, you know, healthy and then we can let them in? Uh, but we're not doing any of that. All we're doing now is we're trying to make it. And, and purposely, the administration has said that they're doing this, trying to make it uh, undesirable to come here by making it painful, making it hard, making it uh, impossible. So don't bother trying. And that's not the message we should be sending to the rest of the world. When you have a gene pool that stagnates and you have like just, a you know, like think of Europe with... Um, well, the kings and queens and what they did to their gene pool by not letting other people in, not letting other genes in or whatever, um, they end up with a real bad situation. And that's what a country does. If you don't let other thoughts come in and other people and beliefs and genes and everything else come into your country, you're just going to stagnate. And that's what the country's been doing for, for decades now is stagnating. You know, we talk about, oh, we got a great economy right now. We've got 2% growth. 2% growth is great. I'm sorry, but I'm old enough to remember when we used to have much better growth. We used to have a much stronger economy. And to just accept that, you can't do a savings account these days. The interest rate is so low, it's at 0%. Nobody can save money. You know, what kind of, what kind of uh, economy do you think you have when everybody is spending everything they get because there's no point in saving anymore? And then, well, they're going to get older and they need savings. They're not going to have it. 
It's just and, it's insane to me. Angie Fritz is watching the live stream, and I I I, I messed up on two accounts. It was uh, it's Colombia, not Ecuador. They're fleeing to, but okay, or, or they're fleeing to all of them, but the majority have gone to Colombia. I just it, you know I did the yeah. white racist thing where I just confuse every single South American country. <sighs> I, I apologize. That was uh, Cody. It was an honest mistake. Don't yeah. beat yourself up. <laughs> My bad. There, uh, we had all the information out before me, and I just uh, dropped the ball on that one. But either way. Um, so, so, uh, Reinhold, you're talking about the, we're only getting these 2% gains. They're very low. They're not as high as we want them to be. To put it in perspective, when we say the economy is struggling, when we get, uh, remember the recession when we had two quarters of negative GDP? Um, you remember that under, under Bush? And you're like, this is the recession. Oh, we're hit so hard. Okay, the last five years, the, their GDP has been negative. That's 20 quarters of negative GDP. So that recession that we had yeah. back under Bush that was, oh, no, we had two in a row. That's been happening them for five years. Here's the other thing. That's marveled by even the poorest countries in the world. Like e even countries with a standard of living, living even less than theirs, they have not had five years of negative GDP. For the last three years, just the last three years, the GDP has lost between 16 and 17 percent every year, which totals at about 50 percent. Now, OK, so let, I, I love talking ec economic numbers, but let's put this in perspective. GDP is gross domestic product, right? This is how much stuff you have. The value, not, not just the value of that stuff, but actual stuff and what people would pay for it. 50 percent of that's gone. So just imagine your life. And in the last three years, 50 percent of it is gone. 50% of your possessions are just not had anymore. So that's that's really, I think, helps put in perspective the, the struggle. It's it's absolutely unbelievable. Well, um, libertarians talk about wanting to see a government collapse. This is what it looks like when a government collapse. Yep. We yeah. don't we don't want that. That's that's yeah. one of the other points. I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt. That's you. what really frustrates me. Yeah, when people say they want that. Go ahead, Dan. No, I, that I was. I'm going to agree with that sentiment. I mean that that frustrates that frustrates me to no end because that that buddy of mine that I was talking about, he is a like I said, I jokingly call him a collapsitarian, but it's like you really no, no matter how well prepared you are, it's it's not going to be fun in games like you think it's going to be. It's it's going to be strife. It's going to be yeah. You might have a an armory full of guns and you might have all the beans and and canned food, but for goodness sakes, no, <laughs> we need to pull back from the precipice and, 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 and find a way to end the business cycle. But I, we're, we're off, we're off on, on a tangent here about, no, it, but it's a valid tangent. I mean, this is the lesson we have to learn from Venezuela is yeah, if is we, are, if we decide to embrace the collapse, I mean, there's the joke, right? That, uh, that libertarians should vote for Bernie Sanders. That way anarchy can come faster because the country country's economy will collapse sooner. Right. But but this is this is essentially what that looks like. Right. And and let me I mean, just a few more, you know, statistics while we're over it. They've gone from. Uh, so let's see here. Four years ago, their primary what they were eating primarily was uh, cornmeal, bread, pasta, vegetables, dairy and fruit. And now the primary things they're eating are beans and yuca, which is kind of like a potato um, to compensate because of it. So not only are they hungrier. And, and they're dying from starvation more, but what they're eating, the quality of what they're eating has died drastically. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's a yucky situation. Now, I did want to continue with, I brought up the open borders thing. Did anybody else have any suggestions for how we, how we help them? Well, I just Googled some things. Um, there is a, I have not refined this list, but there's, um, there's at least one ad from, uh, the IRC to, as to how to help folks in Venezuela. And then there's a CNN article about it, but I've, um, I, I did not get the chance to refine it before you, um, before you said that. So I'm just going to pass that over to you. And, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's, I already see some ideas there, but. Okay. Well, how about my thought is that maybe we should kind of let this play out and not be trying to interfere or direct it like we're trying to do right now. Uh, what about the uh, sanctions that we have placed on them? Those sanctions are not hurting the federal government. They're hurting the people. Um, whether or not releasing the sanctions and getting things moving is going to help because they'll just stop it. I don't know, but yeah. it's, it's still not putting them in a great position. Another thing is there are aid organizations that we can support that 
if they get enough support can go in and try to do something to help those people too. Um, the problem is, is you got a lot of people, I think, who want to see Venezuela fail and are sitting back watching it. The, the, this is where, and, and I'm, I'm a capitalist, but this is kind of where my crowd gets a little off base because when you want to, you should want to not see them suffer anymore. And that's really the, the primary problem that we have is that there is a great deal of suffering going on in Venezuela right now. And it's hard, it should be hard to watch. It should be heart-wrenching. You shouldn't laugh at them and say, this is what you get when you get socialism. Look, if you're a capitalist, you believe in free market values, right? So, so you shouldn't have to ban socialism in a free market so long as the free market can exist. Now, yeah, Venezuela killed the free market. Is it an important lesson? Oh, yes. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, uh, the New York Times, I mean, even the left-leaning New York Times entitled a piece called Yes, Venezuela is a Socialist Catastrophe. Look, it's still a good lesson, but let's not herald this up like this is what we wanted for Venezuela. We wanted Venezuela to choose capitalism. They didn't. Look, they deeply regret it. The people tried to vote otherwise. They tried to get rid of their socialist government, but they, but <laughs> the socialist government wouldn't let it happen. And so there is a lot of suffering that goes down on there, and I just don't want, I don't want the demagogues, I guess, on the writer libertarian side to, to get, to embrace Embrace their their deaths and suffering. We should want to alleviate them. Ultimately, these are people that can be turned into profit-making machines in real capitalism that are just suffering, suffering. And I hate to say waste of life because it's not their fault, but essentially their lives are wasted under this under this socialist system that they have. Hey, Reinhold, do you need to go? Sorry, Hody Johns. <laughs> I I don't need to go. I just have a visitor real quick. So You're okay. No, to be honest with you guys, we've gone we've gone about over where our, where our dailies are supposed to be at. But I'm glad we could get this conversation in the the coup in Venezuela. Um, oh, I mean, let me start with my final words and I'll, I'll throw it to you guys here. Um, if you're the praying type, pray for him. If you're the acting type, act on it. Uh, we just really need we need some difference makers in there. And I think if you are if you are one of those right libertarians that I was talking about, now's the time to show some compassion and not to show vengeance. Yes, if you want to share a post or two about how this validates everything you knew about what government run, I'll specifically say government run socialism sh should be. Fine, hold your head up high, you were right, government-run capitalism is still bad, but better than government-run socialism, right? And and we prefer, of course, government-run nothing, but for now, that this is this is what it is. And so, yes, think, get think about how, yeah, think about how they, the people there in Venezuela would think about it if they saw food and help coming in from a capitalist society trying to help them. They're going to look more favorably on that society. It's how we won the Cold War and, and East Germany and all that stuff is by just, you know, genes and rock and roll and goodwill and all that stuff that we just seem to be more, you know, closed off and nationalist now than we ever were, which is not helping the way we appear to the rest of the country, right. the rest of the world, I mean. Right. No, and, and, and I just say this is your chance to be the economy of mercy and the economy of love, as opposed to the economy of correctness. Look, everybody gets what you're talking about. You've had this discussion forever. Either they're going to embrace capitalism or they're not. But they'll only embrace you if you show that you're coming from it from a place of like being loving and caring and being active as opposed to being dismissive and angry. They're not going to trust somebody who's like, yeah, let the people suffer. This is what they get. You're, they, when people, people who know you in your life attach that ideology to you. And so this is your chance to be a good steward of it. Uh, again, I can't emphasize enough. If you're the praying type, pray for him. I know that's what I would be doing. This is a hard situation to watch. Yeah. Even if people aren't dying, they're dying in the streets. I mean, when you have people that escape that talk about how they don't have a cat to eat guys, that is a bummer. I get bummed when the, when I only have leftover pasta to eat. Okay, so they are dealing with, with a horrifying situation. They are very real people. And I just think that now is the time to treat them as such. Uh, and then whoever wants their final words, go ahead. Go ahead, Reinhold. No, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's kind of the same thing we have with uh, Honduras. We have the Northern Triangle who, because we supported a coup in 2009, their country ended up going into a tailspin of despair just horrible situation to where that area is now the most dangerous place on the planet 
people are fleeing there. And we've seen a 1,200% increase in asylum seekers coming from that area. That's the reason why we have all these people on the border, the caravans coming here, is because we initiated or helped initiate a coup in another country. I don't want to see us do that again and then have more people try to come here because we're making their lives hell. We need to stop doing that. So I just don't want this to be another proxy fight in the war on uh, communism or Cuba or Russia or whatever. Let's help these people. Uh, let's get them a stable government back. Let's you know do what we can to help, but let's not make their life worse. Cool, Dale. You get the you get the closer. Well, um, I, I think I think. Pray, think, and act is probably the best way to go about it. I mean, pray for them. Um, think about the implicate the the political implications for um, for our country if we go that way, and and act if you're if you're able to. Um, I actually just I just actually I am to my pastor and asked him if um, if our denomination was doing anything for the effort, and I told him if not, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw some money to the Catholics if uh, if we're not doing it. But you know. Um, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's the best thing you can do at this point. I mean, you know, the, the small scale person to person effort is probably the best way to go about it. I don't want any government intervention of that type. We don't need, you know, like Reinhold said, we don't need another Honduras. So those are my final thoughts. Yeah. Guys, if you're listening to this show, uh, please let us know if you know of a, 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 we're giving you some good ideas for efforts some philosophical and some just hopeful. But if you know of a great rescue effort going on, please let us know. Discuss it with us. We have a Discord. We have our Facebook group. Um, Reinhold, Hody, Dale, we all exist on Facebook. Please get a hold of us and let us know. We'd love to share it to the group and make a real difference. That's something that makes We're Libertarians very different than other purely philosophical podcasts. But Reinhold, Dale, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, guys, if you like the show, support us on uh, patreon.com, and we will talk to you later. <laughs>